It will now. Oh, it does. Okay. Good. Yes. Very good. So, uh, welcome to um, our webinar with uh, Dr. Margaret Cottle. And we're going to be discussing tonight the issue of euthanasia, normalizing euthanasia, where are we going? Or um, I think we had another title about uh, um, danger ahead. <laughs> danger ahead. Yes, indeed. So um, I wanted to begin the very first question with uh, talking about your article that, um, oh, first of all, let me just introduce myself, Natalie Sonnen. I'm the Executive Director of Life Canada, and we're a national association um, doing pro-life work across the country in Canada. And um, uh, uh, like I said, I have with me today Dr. Margaret Cottle, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm excited to talk about this. Um, Dr. Cottle, you had a, a great uh, paper um, in the World Medical Journal, and I wanted to just um, start with that. Um, and I had a couple of questions here. Um, so you co-authored this article, and uh, I, we, we had a little discussion, you and I, on the, the significance of getting this article into the World Medical Journal for the World Medical Association. So this is not to be confused with the World Health Organization. Um, and it presents significant negative and dangerous effects of euthanasia. Um, and you actually say in the article, the slippery slope is every bit as slippery as the critics had warned. Why is this significant? Why is this journal significant? Why, is it, why was it so important for you to get the paper in there? Lots of questions there. Um, first of all, I guess for folks who may not know me, um, I should say that I'm a palliative care physician here in Vancouver and have been doing palliative care work since really the early days of palliative care here in Canada. I started back in uh, being involved in 1988. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a long time that I've been doing this type of work and uh, have seen a, a lot of things that have happened over that time. So, uh, and at that time, at the beginning, and this is, this is answering your question, <clears throat> I guess eventually, but at that time, we had such a hard time caring for people at the end of life because people were afraid, patients and physicians were afraid that we might, that our, our mandate would be to hasten the death of patients. And it took a lot of work and steady uh, legwork and just being kind and, and explaining things and education to say, no, that's not what palliative care is about. It's about putting, as Dr. Twycross said in the very same uh, issue of the World Medical Journal, it's about putting life into your years when we can no longer put more years into your life and to show you that you matter no matter what, as Dr. Cicely Saunders would say. So uh, having been involved in this for a very long time, uh, I have been able to see firsthand the vulnerability of people and their families when they're facing serious illnesses and at the end of their lives. And it's a, it's a difficult time. It can be a very special sacred time, but it, it's also difficult and vulnerable. So when things are introduced that would uh, upset the, the very fine balance of how we as, society, as a society care for those who are facing these issues, then we have to be extremely careful. So uh, we, most of us who are involved in palliative care, including Dr. Balfour Mount, who is the founder of Palliative Care in Canada, have been uh, vehemently opposed to anything that would hasten the death of a patient. And that really falls into two different categories. There's euthanasia, which is when a doctor or a nurse practitioner, that's who are allowed to do it in Canada, uh, give a lethal injection to end the life of the patient. Or assisted suicide, where someone prescribes or gives the means to the patient to at least start the process. So one of the kind of jargon ways of saying it is that euthanasia is pushing the syringe and uh, assisted suicide is writing the prescription. So I think that's important to know the difference between those things as we'll talk about later, I think. But in Canada, 
because there's, there is a, a, a very rightful concern about, and a, a feeling of like, oh, I don't really want to use the word death or killing or, or suicide or, you know, there's, there's a stigma attached to that. So what has been mandated is that the term that's used in Canada is medical assistance or medical aid in dying. And that kind of makes those of us who have been involved in palliative care for a long time, kind of makes our skin crawl because as Dr. Mount says, for decades, we've been assisting people and their families and their loved ones when they die without killing anybody and without taking any life. So that has, that's been uh, a place where people who are in favor of this practice have co-opted the language. And Natalie, in fact, it's gone so far that at a meeting that was being held, uh, we, we wanted to have a speaker come and the title of his talk was uh, Psychiatric Considerations with Euthanasia, something along those lines. And they would not give continuing medical education credit for the talk unless the title was changed to Psychiatric Considerations in MADE because they said that's what it's called. And so this type of, of concerted effort to control the language has really had consequences across the board. And I think that's where this article comes in because uh, not only are we seeing this uh, insistence on calling it made and and having a euphemism for what it actually means what it actually means is happening but uh the the media across the board almost completely across the board have romanticized this whole process mm -hmm. and they're only telling part of the stories and they are leaving out some of the difficult bits and, and even our medical leadership and our medical media are also, in my opinion, uh, being cheerleaders for these practices. And they have on the monies that come from Canadian doctors have traveled around the world. Uh, I think it's not too fine a point to say evangelizing for euthanasia and assisted suicide. And, so we, we felt there were a group of us back in 2018, soon after the legislation was passed. So the Supreme Court decision came down in 2015. The legislation was passed in June of 2016. And by the fall of 2018, we were concerned enough, there were enough physicians across the country who were concerned about the rapid expansion of this practice within Canada that we, uh, we decided to write about it. So the, the World Medical Association is a group of physicians from around the world, from countries all around the world. And they get together twice a year. It's uh, been thrown into a bit of disarray with COVID, but they meet all over the world. Uh, the fall of 2018, it was in Reykjavik, Iceland, and then it was in South America. And then last uh, October, it was in Tbilisi, Georgia, and it was supposed to be in Portugal this spring and in Spain this fall, but I'm not sure. Portugal meeting was canceled and I'm not sure what's happening this fall. But at the meeting in Reykjavik, a group of us, uh, some of the, the, the authors of a group of us who published this study in the World Medical Journal uh, talking about, uh, we called it Euthanasia in Canada, a cautionary tale. And we, the, a group of the, the, some of the authors and other supporters were able to attend this meeting. And at this meeting, uh, there, Canada and some of the, the other countries, I think the Netherlands and Belgium, uh, some, at least one of those countries, was going to put forward an, a resolution that the World Medical Association should, quote, go neutral on euthanasia and assisted suicide. So what that means is that they, they approve it in some cases because, or they just allow, they don't oppose it. So, uh, if you don't oppose something, then you have to think it's okay in, in some cases. So going neutral isn't really neutral. And we've seen that time and time again. 
wherever it happened here in Canada, wherever it happens when the people, when the organizations go neutral, then pretty soon it comes to uh, endorsing the practice. So our little band showed up at this meeting with this paper that had just been published in the World Medical Journal, and it caused a firestorm. And the Canadian, the official Canadian delegation was furious about this. They withdrew their motion. They said from the podium that, um, that there were mistruths being spoken, that, that there, were de there was deception being practiced. And if anybody wanted to know the truth, they should speak to the individually to the official delegates. And um, so th this is kind of interesting as in the article, every single point we made was, was annotated and had a footnote. So it was really hard. I mean, they could say that, but they couldn't really prove it. And they were, they were so angry <laughs> that this really bizarre thing happened at that particular, at that particular meeting. Uh, the new president was an Israeli physician, and partway through his acceptance speech or his speech to the, to the delegates, one of the official delegates to the Canadian uh, delegation realized that he, his speech was quoting Dr. Chris Simpson, who had been a CMA president in the past. And it was a very uh, general statement about how we need to care for our patients and work together. And, you know, one of these sort of motherhood statements. And um, they called him out on it and accused him of plagiarism. And he immediately said, gosh, I'm very sorry. I, English isn't my first language. I had a speechwriter write this for me. I'm very happy to uh, attribute Dr. this quotation to Dr. Simpson. They would have none of it. They demanded his resignation. And when he refused to resign, the Canadian delegation <laughs> walked out of this meeting on ethical grounds because of plagiarism. It's, it, it's almost breathtaking when you think about it that it was, they were willing to walk out because of this gentleman's, this doctor's inadvertent plagiarism, but they came to the meeting trying to change 2,400 years of Hippocratic tradition that says we don't kill our patients. Mm -hmm. And I, I spoke to someone about this afterward, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Sean Murphy from the Protection of Conscience Group. And he said, well, all that really shows you is that we all agree that plagiarism is wrong. We just don't agree that killing patients is wrong. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's kind of astonishing. But what we have found that happened as a result of that small group of people. So never say a small thing doesn't matter. And I've heard people say, well, if you don't, if you think small things don't matter, then you've never been in a dark room with a mosquito. And I think that it's, so we were the mosquitoes in that room, but I think we were bringing the light. Um, I mean, I didn't, did not actually attend, but our group was. And we found that over the, the last year or so after that had happened, when the people came back a year later, some of the smaller nations said, we, we came to this, this uh, conference prepared to say, well, if that's what the powerful people want, I guess we should go along with it. But your article and your little group gave us the courage to say, no, we respect life. We respect all our citizens. We want to care for the people who are vulnerable among us. And so when, when the group came back from Tbilisi saying, we, we made a difference, then uh, Dr. Scott and Dr. Herx and I, who are all palliative care physicians, decided that it was time to give an update. It had been two years, almost two years, since um, the, the data that we were using before. And with the new legislation that's pending and the Trushan decision and lots of other things that we found, we thought it was time to write another, another um article that would address some of these things and show how fast things had happened. Mm -hmm. um, the, the quotation you had at the beginning was actually from, uh, from an editorial. It wasn't our own words, but it's so true. It, it's mm -hmm. been every bit as slippery as we thought it would be. And it's, it's something that is, is really, is, is very sad. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, I, I was on a committee with the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians, and I said, well, at the, this was before the law came in, but after the court decision, and I said, you know, I don't think there are going to be a lot of physicians who are going to be lining up to kill their patients. And one of the people on this, um, on this committee who was in favor of the practice said to me, uh, said, oh, now, you know, be careful of your inflammatory language. And I said, well, you know, uh, I'm willing to play nice in the sandbox here, but what am I supposed to say? How, what am I supposed to say? This is what this is. And so the person thought about it and then said, well, you could say taking the life of the patients. So even that little bit is being, is being controlled. Mm -hmm. not allowed to say that the patient's being killed when you're giving a lethal injection. That's, they don't say that the, when capital punishment is being practiced in, the, in different states in the U.S. that the, the person who goes and does it is taking the life. They say they're executing or killing the person. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting how the, this, the language has been co-opted and have, has been Churchill used to say that they said about him that he marshaled the language. Well, these, these people are massacring the language, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, this, so the article that appears now in the World uh, Medical Journal, this is your kind of your second edition yes. Yes. with the updates. And I will make that available to everybody who's listening on the line. So, um, and I, I do apologize. I'm, I'm a rookie journalist here. Um, <laughs> I didn't give a proper introduction to you in the beginning. Oh, no um, I'm, I'm very focused on my questions and, and the substance of, of what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm, uh, it's just incredible to hear you, to hear that story again, really. It really is remarkable. And I think actually it gives uh, tremendous hope that even these little efforts can actually do so much. And so I think with this whole World Medical Association statement that they were going to just make, you know, euthanasia, <clears throat> their stance was going to become neutral. And, and they currently now stand against, very, very strongly stand against euthanasia. So this is an international body that's taken a stance because of you and your team and, and this article um, that you published. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful story. Yeah, I think, I think it should give us, uh, I think it should give everyone the, the idea about how important it is to tell your stories, mm -hmm. how important it is to speak up. Uh, I think we have, many of us have heard the idea that all it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to say nothing. And I think that's especially true. We become very fearful about speaking up and saying, hey, I think the way we need to care for each, we need to care for each other, not kill mm -hmm. each other, not take the life of our fellow citizens. When, when life gets hard, we need to get in there and, and help each other. That was, that's one of the deep values of being Canadian is that we, we have a, a sort of universal healthcare system that we're proud of because we don't want to leave anybody behind. We have social networks. We're proud of these things. And what is that going to do to our national psyche if when someone gets into a difficult situation, we're saying, oh, well, you know, if, if you don't think your life is worth living anymore, we'll just help you end it. And we'll make sure it's peaceful and it's all romantic and you get to have a party and all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you, you yeah. can't get around the fact that instead of doing the hard work that Dr. Mount and Dr. Scott and Dr. Herx and everyone have, have pioneered to say, if somebody says, oh, I just wish I were dead, or I wish this whole thing was over, then you say, well, why? What's, what is it that is making this hard for you? Is it a physical symptom, which it almost never is, I would mm -hmm. thank you. It's usually existential things. Uh, right. I don't have joy anymore. I don't have hope anymore. I feel like I'm a burden to people around me. How do we get that back? You know, mm -hmm. what's the worst part of this? What, what, how can we reframe hope? What mm -hmm. can we do? And it, Canadians are resourceful. I've said this many times. We learned how to fish in the North Atlantic and farm on the prairies. We can figure out how to care for each other mm -hmm. and how to do it even when it's hard. 
This yeah. is what sets us apart as human beings from animals is that when things are hard, we don't run away. We, we run toward people who are suffering. And anybody who has ever been through a situation like this uh, knows that it was really hard, but you, you were glad you were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, it's a, I call it true gold instead of false gold. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, the false glitter of autonomy. I can do whatever I want to is like a, it's like a little plastic gold thing you get in a Cracker Jack box. But the true gold that is refined in the fire, and that's the fire of not knowing whether you're going to be able to get up another time in the night with uh, a toddler who's vomiting, or a parent who's breathless, or uh, a spouse who has Alzheimer's, or whatever. That mm -hmm. th that's the goal that that it it you find that you are enough for the situation, and that people around you are enough. And I, I think that's one of the really hard things about this COVID uh, time is that people are uh, are alone uh, in the midst of it. Uh, older spouses are caring for, for uh, you know, elderly, an elderly spouse is caring for an elderly spouse because nobody else is allowed in. Uh, and you don't want to go to a hospice or a palliative care unit where you're only allowed to have one visitor because then you can't have the family support and the love that's there. So yeah. there, there are, but we're, we're better than just saying, oh, you, you think you want to die? Great. We'll make sure it happens in a peaceful way. That's yeah. Yeah. not yeah. who we are. Yeah. So I, I, I want to get into it. That's so true, you know, and, and it really, it undermines the whole purpose of living because, you know, life is suffering and, and it's how, how we respond to that that really is, you know, it shows kind of what we're made of, you know, and, and these things are so important. Our whole Dying Hill program deals with this issue of suffering and how we respond to suffering. And uh, whether we just kind of throw our ar arms up and give up or whether we actually see meaning in it. And there's a whole, you know, we could spend a whole time talking, talking about that. I do want to jump in and I, I, I want to ask you a little bit about um, the actual issues because I, I want people to know what's really going on in Canada. We ran a poll in um, Canada. So Life Canada does a lot of polling and we get, are able to kind of get the pulse of what Canadians are thinking. And right before the legislation, uh, it was it, the Supreme Court had already been decided. It was unanimous. You know, we, we were going to have this thing. So now it was thrown to the legislature and they were debating. And uh, we ran a poll and we found that high numbers, 70, it was 71% of people uh, were open to the idea of euthanasia and physician assisted suicide. And um, they wanted it only in terms of exceptional cases. They, they thought and they were convinced that this was only going to happen in exceptional cases and with very strict safeguards. And I want you to touch on this issue because the whole notion of safeguards and walk us through what these safeguards are and what has actually happened to these safeguards and what is going to happen if this Bill C-7 goes through. Well, as I said for years before this was uh, debated and passed, that safeguards are a bit of a joke. They're an illusion. Uh, but that is the way that these things happen. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the people who want to bring these things in find uh, a really difficult case and it's a worst case scenario. And they say, how could you deny this to this person? You, um, and I, I get it all the time. People say to me, oh, well, Dr. Cottle, the only reason you don't want to have people have the, have euthanasia and assisted suicide is that you enjoy watching people suffer. I mean, they, they say that to me. So, wow. you know, that's, it just shows you how things have degenerated. But uh, the, this idea that, that okay well we'll allow it for just this little tiny group of people where it would be where it's it's hard to say you know somebody's th that that you 
how shall I phrase this, that you understand the, the desire that the person has for a hasten death. And mm -hmm. uh, you, we, we get that. I know there are some difficult cases with that. Oh, I'm I, sure. And you've worked with that. I have. And I, I understand sure. that. Mm -hmm. and, however, um, this idea that somehow you can open the door for only some people just does not happen in Canadian law. The moment you say, okay, um, this, we're going to allow this, then what, how are you going to quantify suffering? Because the Supreme Court, it was such an open, wide open decision. All the criteria were, were that you had to have a grievous and irremediable condition. It didn't say anything about being at the end of life. And that that was only put in in the legislation to try to put in some safeguards. Um, you, it had to be, um, it had to cause suffering and that could be, and it, the condition actually could be a disability too. It didn't have to be any kind of a disease process. It could be a congenital disability or an acquired disability. Uh, it had to cause suffering, um, uh, unrelieved suffering. And it, um, this unrelieved suffering could be purely psychological and it had to be uh, not amenable to a treatment that was acceptable to you. So one, one of my compatriots said, well, you know, I'm going bald. And if I feel like I'd like to have euthanasia before I go bald, uh, who are you to tell me that my suffering, you know, it's something that's irremediable. To me, it's a grievous condition. I don't want to have a hair transplant. You know, this is the kind of level that we were talking about. And it, it opens it up for people who would have, say, diabetes and don't want to take insulin, or there's lots of different things that are there. So when this decision was handed down, the writing was really on the wall about that this was never going to be about just the um, just the really tough cases. Now, the only way that that could have happened was the reason that the Supreme Court struck down the old law of prohibition was they said that well, we think we can we can that that, that um, there's not going to be that much death caused by this. So you can't prove to us that it's going to be all that that terrible. So we're going to allow it to happen. And if we had turned around as a country and said, no, we just don't kill each other, then that would have overridden what the Supreme Court said, because they were striking down a prohibition based on this idea that, well, there wasn't that much danger that they could see. So, uh, but we didn't do that. And in fact, the Supreme Court decision never said anything about this having to be a right in Canada. All it said was that if you could find a willing practitioner, that it shouldn't necessarily be illegal. However, it was written into the legislation that it should be part of the Health Canada, the regulations. So now in Canada, you actually have a, a right to have made to have euthanasia, but you don't have a right to have proper palliative care or any palliative care. So it's, a, it's, it's really an, a completely upside down system. And uh, the, to be fair, I think uh, Jody Wilson-Rabel, who was a minister of, uh, of justice at the time and the attorney general, and Jane Philpott, Dr. Jane Philpott, who was the minister of health, they really uh, went against their own party and the findings of their own party's so-called task force committee mm -hmm. that um, to put in a few safeguards. And the safeguards that they put in place in this legislation were a reflection period of 10 days, around 10 days, uh, that you had to have two different assessors who were supposed to be independent of one another that you needed to be competent, which is a, a medical definition of being uh, able to understand the, what's going on, what's happening in your life, and that you needed to be free from coercion. They didn't say how that was. And they also put in this condition that your death needed to be reasonably foreseeable. So I happened to be with a group of doctors and lawyers 
with, for about two hours with Minister Wilson Rabo, and she actually listened very carefully to what we had to say. And we said to her, what is this about reasonably foreseeable? I mean, everyone's death technically is reasonably foreseeable. Mm -hmm. you, know, you were born 200 years ago. I don't care what kind of a good attitude you had, you are not with us anymore. So she, she kind of was a little bit sheepish about this. And she said, well, that's kind of a legal term we use, but we thought you doctors would know what it meant. <laughs> but no, we don't know what it means. This is a law, this isn't medicine. And so what it means in legal terms is whether or not you could tell uh, it would be reasonable for you to foresee the results of your action. So for example, if I have a loaded gun and I, I'm uh, well, holding it up to somebody's head and I pull the trigger or I spin the chamber playing Russian roulette or something, then it's reasonably foreseeable that that could cause the death of a person. However, if there's a gas leak in my house and I don't know it, and I come in and I flip the light switch and the house blows up and it kills somebody who's with me, that was not reasonably foreseeable. Yeah. So you can see the difference between that. So they, they were trying to put this kind of language into it to protect people. But um, it's all of those things have been completely steamrolled. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the reflection, we've got the statistics in this paper. And I'd also like to say that although it says that it's the World Medical Journal and anybody just by Googling World Medical Journal can find this, you don't have to get it from, from Natalie, but um, the, the, we've got, the stats are right there about the number of times that, that these things are, are overridden and not followed. And even when, even when people who are, are raising concerns about it have documented these concerns, the, the paper is a medical paper, but it's really more of a medical, almost medical sociology, medical uh, uh, culture, uh, and it's easy for lay people to read. The it is, yeah. is, but it's not one of these really stuffy scientific papers. Uh, we've actually done you a service by pulling together the things that the, the mainstream and the medical media are not telling you are happening. And every single bit of it is footnoted. So there's there are footnotes in there about how the waiting period has been waived, how it's been steamrolled, how uh, people have not been reasonably, had a death that's reasonably foreseeable, how there have been people who are not competent, where there are, have been people who we're pretty certain uh, have been coerced, that there have been people who have had euthanasia simply because they couldn't get uh, decent medical care. Uh, all of these things uh, have been documented. And so this idea that somehow we have these great safeguards and that Oh well, you know we're gonna we're gonna open this up, and it's only gonna be for this small group of people who everybody feels very sad for, mm -hmm. uh, me included. Uh, but that's that's not what law is about. Mm -hmm. Law and society is about how do we care for the most vulnerable among us? How do we care for the people who need it the most? And that's not what this law has been doing. And with the um, in the fall that we had a decision, the Truchon and Gladue decision in Quebec Superior Court. And this was um, a decision that the Truchon and Gladue were two Quebecers who, uh, Quebec citizens who had, um, who had long-term disabilities. And they felt that it was discriminatory against them not to be able to have euthanasia if they wanted it, if they were tired of living with their disability. So they took it to the Quebec Superior Court. Now, the timing of this whole decision is very suspicious to me. So the decision was released after the election had been called, uh, our federal election. And in order for this to be appealed uh, to the Supreme Court, our uh, the current government or the government of the time would have had to appeal it within 30 days, which was before the election was coming. So there wasn't any legislature, there's no parliament sitting, there was no way to bring pressure, any of that. And the Trudeau government simply said, we're not going to appeal it. So that means that it allows this decision to stand 
that it was unconstitutional for these people to be denied the, uh, the uh, maid to be denied euthanasia because, simply because their deaths were not reasonably foreseeable. And that provision had been gotten around so many different ways, it was almost foolish to, to, bring, the, to bring the case. But that, that's what happened. And so now with the new government, they are left with this decision that they have to somehow address this uh, in Canadian law. And the way that they have talked about addressing this is just to say, well, you know, the, that's what the decision was. So now you don't have to have a death that's reasonably foreseeable. So right. how, are, and how are you going to define grievous and irremediable uh, disease? How are you going to define um, uh, intolerable suffering? This, these things are like sand through your fingers. They, they're just not there. And and the other thing that the, the Liberal Party and the supporters of euthanasia wanted to do at the time of the original legislation was they wanted to have uh, it available for mature minors or children and for people who wanted it by advanced directive and for psychiatric reasons only. And uh, Minister Wilson Rabo and, and Minister Philpott in the legislation that they put forward said that, no, we're, we are gonna not do those things right now. We will evaluate those in five years. So that's coming now as well. And the current legislation is, um, is bringing in the stuff for mature minors. And if, if people don't think that this is coming, they are sadly mistaken. It's been well over a year now, even though it's still illegal that the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, our kind of flagship children's hospital in Canada, has had a protocol for- Yeah, they're pushing. Yeah, that for euthanasia for children, even though it's not even legal yet. Mm -hmm. um, and the, there are, uh, there's a big debate going on within the psychiatric community about whether there's such a thing as uh, a psychiatric illness that's actually irremediable. And the, this, this legislature is also saying that the 10-day the, the reflection period should be waived. So mm -hmm. if you have a really serious uh, illness, let's say, uh, so if we're, if we're thinking about bringing it in for psychiatric reasons, or at, at least at some point not making it illegal, let's say you have a serious psychiatric illness, or even, um, even say an addiction, Okay, which would qualify under, under the, the current legislation. It can take you years to get treatment for that. So what kind of a society are we that says, oh, if you decide you wanna die, we'll make sure that it happens. And we're not even gonna make you wait 10 days to see whether you change your mind, which we know happens from the literature. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll kill you today, but we'll, we'll make you wait two years to get life-saving treatment of some sort, you know, and, and this leads into long-term care facilities and other things like that. You know, the, the Supreme Court decision was not even 12 hours old when I was on TV programs and news programs and everything back in 2015. And the proponents of this had been saying, oh, it's only for these really difficult cases. So I was on these programs and I was saying, well, we better have the very best safeguards because it needs to be only for these really tough cases or we're gonna open up a really bad can of worms. And um, the people that I was on the programs with who had been saying that it was all, before this came down, that it was only for these difficult cases, said, oh, well, don't be too hasty, you know. So people in other parts suffer too and there are more people that are gonna want this than, than, than you think right now. And I said, well, probably not, but it, this is one of the things where we're not showing that we're caring for each other in how, how we're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a troubling situation and mm -hmm. we do have a lot of, uh, if people need to talk to their, talk to their members of parliament uh, and they aren't going to hear you. I went and spoke for, and I have to give her credit, she gave me half an hour, which is very unusual for a member of parliament. But I went and spoke to my own member of parliament 
um, this past summer before the, the election was called to say that I really wanted to have better safeguards and to have uh, not to have this opened up. And she said that I was the only person in the entire riding who had contacted her saying, I wanted it to be more restrictive. Everybody else had said, oh, I want to be able to have this if I ever get Alzheimer's. They wanted it opened up for basically for open season. And I said to her, I said to her, you know, for Canada to say that we support euthanasia, we support MAID, it means that there are some lives that are not worth living, that we have mm -hmm. said that. And she said, oh, well, I totally disagree with that. And I said, if you are going to support a practice with your tax dollars, with your laws, with your personnel, with, um, with, your, with your, your legislation, with your regulations, all of these things, then you, you're, you're not saying to this person, um, you're, you're not using the suicide prevention, you're saying, we think it's okay. We think yeah. that you have, that, that you're right, that when you think your life is not worth living, then we will agree with you, or we will allow you to continue to think that. Yeah, and she not fighting for your life. get her to, to agree to, well, that's just wrong. No, I don't think that. All lives are worth living. And, but she couldn't understand that if you're going to pay for it, regulate it, uh, so you, that you're supporting it at some level. You are yeah. not going to be taking a life that you actually believe is still worth living. So. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's not like suicide, you know, when you've got the whole, your whole system working uh, together to end lives. It's not the same thing as suicide. And I think that's a, another point where people, people get these things confused. This is legalization of a practice. It's our culture saying yes. Some lives are not worth fighting for. Yeah. So I wanted to quickly, just very quickly touch on the numbers because I think this is also, um, just so people are aware, you know, because the, uh, again, people were saying, oh, you know, this is only going to be for the very few, you know, and quickly it's, it's snowballed. Yeah. So just quickly talk on the numbers. And I, I want to jump into the, uh, a question on, on principles okay. um, and the, the organ donor stuff, but just quickly let us. Other joyful things. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think the numbers are, are, are rather interesting that we are now within, uh, with four years into this, we're up at 2% of all deaths in Canada being, uh, being euthanasia deaths. Last year, in 2018, which is the last year that there are statistics for both available, we had twice as many deaths from euthanasia that we had from motor vehicle accidents. Okay, so this is the kind of level of, that, that, this, has, uh, that this has come to. Uh, these levels were not reached in other permissive countries like Belgium and the Netherlands for 10 years or so. Uh, the, the actual statistics are right in the paper, but I think what, needs, what we need to hear is that the, the slope has been very slippery and it's become mm -hmm. normalized. It wasn't just something that was legal and, ugh, we feel pretty awful about this, but this person is really suffering and you know, and not really wanting to do this, but, oh, this is, this is something wonderful. You know, we should celebrate this. It should, you should be able to have a party. And you, all you have to do is look at some of the, the things that are there in the media and see how many people have seen it as, as a party atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very sad that we are having that. The interesting thing is, and I think that this was one of the things that we wanted to get across to jurisdictions where this is still not legal. So if you're in a state in the United States or if you're someplace in the world where this is not legal and you're listening to us, please, please, please try never to get euthanasia. If you have to get something in your jurisdiction, assisted suicide needs to be what happens because when euthanasia comes, it's brought in as this sterile, uh, just extension of a medical procedure and the numbers go up like our numbers have gone. In Washington and Oregon, where in Oregon, for example, where assisted suicide has been legal for um, over 20 years, their percentage of deaths is a tenth of what ours is. Mm -hmm. It's like 0.2 to 0.3. It has increased, 
but it has not increased at the exponential rate that ours has increased. And there isn't the same kind of acceptance of, oh, how wonderful this is, and oh, well, you just get the doctor to come, and it's so easy, you just fall asleep, and it all happens, and it's so definite. And, um, and they also have, it's, it's not um, completely safe because as soon as the medicine leaves the pharmacy, nobody asks any questions. So if you took it home because you thought you might like to have it sometime, then you know, your heir uh, who could give it to you or you know, could smother you and flush it down the toilet, there's no, there's no requirement for it to be observed. But in some ways, that has been, this sounds really backwards, but it's been preservative. Because what happens here in Canada is you set a date. And even if you're doing assisted suicide, which is very rare, but it has happened, then you have to have an observer. So that person is scheduled to come to your house. And they, they are required to ask you, are you sure you want to go through with this? But who is going to say, well, you know, I've changed my mind. You came out here, you did all this stuff, you got all the paperwork done, but I don't think I'm going to do it today. You know, it just, it's, it's like the, the bride that gets to the altar and realizes that she's making a mistake. Very few of those people have the courage or the, or the groom <laughs> have the courage to say, you know, what the, I'm, I'm not going to do this right now. And that's kind of what, what happens with this, except the consequences are way worse. The person ends up dead. Yeah. I think Dr. Harvey Chalkanoff talks about this and he calls it ambivalence. Yeah. Yeah. That, that the euthanasia patient kind of has this ambivalence because the date's been set and all these important people have arrived and they're standing there with their flip charts and and you might have changed your mind but you're you're kind of in this situation whereas with assisted suicide it's more you know the pills might sit there for a while and you might never take them yeah so, yeah dr yeah. chapinoff has done some amazing work and he he has the he started back in the 90s doing really good research about what it, what is involved in dignity conserving care and so he's he's wonderful uh, all the different things that he's done with that and but even even with the assisted suicide there was a uh, uh there was a high profile case of a woman from california Brittany maynard who moved from california to oregon in order to get assisted suicide and she set this date that she was going to do it after her birthday and and her husband they made all these videos with the dying with dignity folks in the u.s and and her husband was in on all of this and and um she kind of got near the, well you know i just kind of had penciled that date in and so people were kind of hanging around ready for her to do this and she finally got sick of it and just took the took the pills mm -hmm. and you know you wonder if someone had said to her well you know why Mm -hmm. How can we help you reframe hope in this? It's mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's a really it's it's a really sad situation. But the other things we were leading on to is once you say that there's such a thing as a life not worth living, then you know it's it's all very utilitarian. So yeah. well, if your life isn't worth living and you don't want it anymore, there are these eight different people who are wanting organs who would be really grateful to, to have your organs. And if you don't really think that you want to live anymore, then, well, gosh, you know, we, we're, we'd be very happy not to have to um, put the home care in or to pay for your medications or pay for nursing care or whatever. You know, gosh, if you're going to be that selfless that you are just going to check out then um, we'll, we'll help you out with that. We'll, we'll do, right. do that. Yeah. Just a, a couple of things. You know, I read an article written by Brittany Maynard for CNN. And um, we do this in our Dying Heal pro program. And we contrast it with a woman, uh, Cheryl Rostek, who yeah. was writing just in a, a little Chilliwack news. And her, her, she accepted what was you know, coming down the pipe, they have this very similar condition, I think, same, same uh, brain tumor. And you could see with Brittany Maynard, the fear, it was all about the future and the gloom and doom of the future and what she was seeing and, and her response to something that actually hadn't happened. Yeah. Um, as opposed to Shell Rostek, who was just living each day, one day at a time and living, as you said, you had that beautiful line in the very beginning, giving what was it giving life to your 
to your years instead of years to your life. And she was really living that. Yeah. Um, and it's very beautiful to see that the contrasting um, sort of innate philosophy behind the two kind of schools of thought and how how they bear bear themselves out. I want to I want to jump in with this this idea of it was in the article where you had written about this woman who was had chosen a, a euthanasia and then when she found out that she could actually give her organs, she she was elated. Yeah. And um, I, I just, I can see that, you know, it's a, it's a false sense of, you know, doing good. And there's, there's some principles at work, obviously, you know, uh, we can talk about principles like um, the do no harm principle, which is the basic uh, principle in medicine, right? You, you, you don't want to do harm. Uh, which obviously is being done in in the act of euthanasia, but then there's also the principle of the um, uh, the end doesn't justify the means, or the means doesn't justify the end. And in this case, um, you know, uh, here we have these people who are actually justifying their euthanasia death because they are thinking that they can give organs to others. Yeah. And uh, just just to discuss that, I think you said there were even um, ways of killing these patients to preserve the organs. Yeah, there's there, there are some there are some protocols that they would like to see with that. I, I think um, I think this is where we really need to step back and I, I talk about having the eagle eye view <laughs> instead of the really close up view. So the mm. close up view, in my opinion, with this is just this this hyper focus on autonomy. Okay, and everything is all about autonomy. Well, you know, that's what the person wanted, fine. You know, it's all about autonomy. And it it kind of lets us off the hook as a culture. Whereas we, we really understand that it's not all about autonomy. And if I wanna have a little nuclear reactor in my backyard, I'm not allowed to do that. In fact, in Vancouver, you can't even smoke outdoors on a public beach because of secondhand smoke. And so we understand this principle that what affects one of us affects all of us. And we, we see that across so many different spheres. So this idea that, um, that somehow you've got this, uh, that there's this autonomous right, and the little catchphrase is, my life, my death, my choice. Mm -hmm. So you need to back off and stop telling me what to do. And even if I couch this in terms of human rights, uh, and how people with disabilities are going to be viewed, et cetera, I'm still told, stop cramming your religion down my throat. So uh, the, the idea that somehow, even the things I believe about humanity and about how we care for each other, that is somehow something that, or I'm cramming this down another person's throat. But it's, it's not. Every sing, nobody dies in a vacuum. Nobody lives in a vacuum. Uh, one of the things that I have started doing when I give talks about this is getting a bunch of people up from the audience and as my voluntold <laughs> helpers and having one person represent the patient and say, okay, you're the patient. And then I get someone to stand up and you're the doctor and you're the nurse and you're the ward clerk and you're the clergy uh, and you're the funeral director and you're the first responders and you're the neighbors and you're the legislators and you're the teachers and you're the family um, and you're the pharmacy, <laughs> you're the respiratory therapist. You go on and on. And then I get a whole big group of people up there and then I say, and each one of these people represents an entire team of people. So how autonomous does this look to you that this individual is, these, these people are all complicit in this individual's death. Mm -hmm. uh, when someone commits suicide by taking too many pills or doing something violent, we, we may say to ourselves, gosh, I should have seen it coming. I wish I'd intervened, whatever. But we don't have that sense that most time, if, if you didn't, if you weren't complicit, that gosh, I gave the person the pills, or I facilitated this, or, or I made it easier for this person to do that. But each one of these individuals has in some way participated in this hasten death of this individual. And so for that person to say that it's only my life, my death, my choice, is just, uh, it, it's, it's not true. And right. on top of all of that, there's another whole group of people behind all those folks who are pushing people to become involved. 
the, the, the colleges are saying to the physicians, you need to be involved in this because it's a right. The nurses unions and the nursing profession have said, you have to be involved. Uh, well, you're a conscientious objector, but you may not get a job because of that. Um, the pharmacists have said, you can't, the, the, at least in BC, you, you can't refuse to fill a prescription based on your conscience. So there, there are all of these things. It's just simply not true that, um, that it's all about autonomy. And right. so when this person says, oh, well, I just feel elated and I'm doing this, we need to step back and say, what is this saying about us as a culture? If someone is going to do this thing that is going to cheapen all of us and impoverish all of us, that we put this gloss on it of, of altruism, of being willing to donate these things. And one of the things I think that there's this word dignity that has also been co-opted by the other side. And dignity, in my view, is not something that you can lose. If you're not feeling, dignity is something that you have inherently because of who you are as a human being. And if you are not feeling dignified or respected, that's a problem that the rest of us have, that we need to figure out ways to come alongside you to say, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to be able to speak. You don't have to be able to toilet yourself. You don't have to do anything except allow us to care for you to be a member of our human family. That's what this is all about. You are not undignified because you need help using the toilet any more than my granddaughter is or my grandson is undignified. Mm -hmm. Um, you deserve to live in a place that doesn't smell like urine, just like my grandchildren do, um, even if you're not continent. Um, you, when I was on those television programs, people would sneer at me and say, oh, Dr. Cottle, don't be so sure you don't want euthanasia until you've been inside a nursing home. Well, I've done palliative care inside nursing homes for many years, and it's, it's, it's a travesty what goes on. And we've, we've seen this come to the fore now. That's one of the things that COVID-19 has done, has shown us the state of our long-term care facilities. Exactly. It's, it is incredibly tragic what has, what has happened, it, what has been happening. Um, and, you know, it's, to me, it's actually obscene that someone would say, I'd rather be dead than to go to a place where people are cared for when they've when they have contributed to society for their whole lives. You know, right. is, what is wrong with us? <laughs> what is yeah. wrong with us? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, quickly talk about um, healthcare providers and the whole issue of conscience protection, because this has been also a big issue. Um, and also the, the issue with the Delta hospice, which okay. I'm sure you're very familiar with and what's, what's going to happen there. Okay. So first of all, I, I never call myself a provider. I refuse to use that term. I'm a healthcare professional, I'm a clinician, I'm a physician. I think anybody who is in the healthcare, any kind of healthcare profession can still be a professional, a nurse, a respiratory therapist. The, the term was used to try to be more inclusive. But to me, it, what it does is it, it um, furthers this idea that that you are a healthcare consumer. And so there's consumers, providers, and consumers. So if you're a consumer, then you can, you can say, I want you to kill me. And if I'm a provider, I do it. Actually, that's the only place I use the word provider is because I don't think it's part of healthcare. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is you talked about, we talked about Hippocratic tradition and do no harm. But the interesting thing is that people who do provide euthanasia actually consider themselves to be Hippocratic physicians because they feel that I am doing harm by refusing to use the means that I have to end suffering. So there, you know, we're, we're so far apart, chasms apart in, in what the language is used for that simply do no harm doesn't, doesn't really work anymore for that. So, you know, that, that's kind of an interesting thing that when you say, well, do no harm, that's what they, they, they accuse me of doing harm because mm -hmm. I want people to con continue to live and to have whatever healing can take place in, in those moments. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in terms of protection of conscience, I think if we consider ourselves professionals, 
then what, what I do as a professional is that I give my opinion. I use my expertise and my years of experience to say, my training to say, you know, here are some of the options. Let's look at those things. What do you think would work for you? And you have the, the right and the privilege to accept or reject anything that I say. I can't force those things on you. I wouldn't want to. So that's why I'm a professional. And I have um, really, in the past, it was called more of a covenantal relationship with my patients. I refuse to call them clients. Uh, nurses now will call, they're asked to call the patients clients because it's considered to be less paternalistic. But, you know, I think it's worse to be uh, a place where an untrained, unschooled, unexperienced client is telling an experienced uh, provider what to do and what he or she wants. I am not a vending machine. I am here to do my best to give you the best recommendations about what I think is best for you. And uh, that is a professional responsibility I have. And part of that is, to, is a duty to, in doing what I feel is best for my patients is that I never feel that taking the life of a patient is what's best for that patient. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, the College of Physicians of, and Surgeons in Ontario has uh, won a case and the court actually said that they realized that this was going against the conscience rights of the physicians involved, but they said they didn't care because they felt like um, access had to be there for patients, even though there is no evidence that access has ever been denied to patients. Um, and that there are jurisdictions such as Alberta where there are central numbers and lines where you would not have to, to go through this. Now, if you, if you wanna have, uh, there's never been the onus, the responsibility on the individual physician before this, that if a patient wants something, that that, per that particular physician has to go out and find it for the patient. Mm -hmm. if, if, the, if it's supposed to be provided by, by the system, then the system needs to figure out a way to get that for the patient. But it, it, it wasn't ever supposed to be the individual physician that did this. If we've decided collectively that euthanasia is a good idea, then collectively we need to come up with solutions so that um, professionals who, who have an objection to this on clinical grounds, on moral grounds, on uh, ethical grounds can, can bow out of it. And right. there, there isn't any reason why that can't happen. There are plenty of people, and especially if, as proponents say, well, we're only going to have 2% of the deaths. Well, that means 98% of people who are dying don't want anything to do with this. And that kind of leads into the Delta hospice situation. Things have gotten a little more complicated out there. And you know what? It's the government's fault that it has gotten more complicated because the Speaker of the House, um, the Speaker of the House of the Legislature, the BC Legislature, uh, commissioned a white paper about how MAID should be in, implemented in the, um, in the, the long-term care and the hospice facilities within the province of British Columbia. And they put forward this very reasonable suggestion. They said that any of the facilities that were 100% controlled by government or uh, supported by government funding should have to do it. Fine, you know, we're giving you the money. This is of our place. It's, you know, our house, our rules, fine. And then if there were other places that uh, had, you know, less percentage of the, of the money, especially if, if they built the hospice themselves, which, which they did in Delta, mm -hmm. and they had their own board and their own bylaws and everything like that, that if they provided at least 50% of the funding, that they should be allowed to opt out of the practice. Because they're, especially in places like the Delta Hospice, where they are right next door to the Delta Hospital, which is actually probably, it's probably closer to go from the, the hospice, the Irene Thomas Hospice to the Delta Hospital than it is to go from one side of Surrey Memorial Hospital to the other. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have it, I don't have it, uh, I haven't measured it, but my guess is it would take you less time to do that. And right. so, you know, the idea that somehow it was, it was, um, 
denying access and all of this, those are just real red herrings. And if we, I had an interesting thing that, that happened to me. And so there was a reasonable solution to doing this that would not have denied access, that would and would have provided a way around this that that, mm. was, that that everybody could agree on. But oh no, we have to we have to just ram it. Talking about ramming down things people things down people's throats, throats. being rammed down people's throats, and um, you know the vitriol and the things that have happened there are just really unfortunate. Considering that the 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 society there came together and raised the money to build that facility, and it's not a big it's not a big community. But mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an example of, of just where this thinking goes. Uh, mm -hmm. Soon after the legislation came, uh, or the court decision came out, I got a call from a producer at CBC who said, um, you know, we want you to come on and talk about, we've heard that St. Paul's Hospital, which is a Catholic hospital in Providence Health, is not going to allow euthanasia on their premises. And we think this is terrible, and would you come down and talk about it? And if you don't think it's terrible, you know, would you give the other side? And I said, well, you know, I have a brand new granddaughter. And I said, I promise to take care of her for the afternoon. And for five minutes on your TV program, I'm not going to give that up. But I said, you know, I don't think it's such a terrible idea. Um, I said, if 98% of the people or 95% of the people feel like they never want to have euthanasia, they should be able to have some euthanasia free zones where they know that they can go and that their worst day is not going to be their last day. That if, if I somehow am so upset for whatever reason, whether I have uncontrollable symptoms or whether existentially or spiritually, I'm just so down that I, I just wish I would die, that, that nobody in that institution is going to take me at, at face value and go against these things that I have held so dear for, for my entire life, that I can be safe to say I wish I were dead and not... And, and not be afraid that somebody's going to really believe they're gonna me. Kill you. They're, going to, they're going to care for me. So mm -hmm. she says to me, well, you don't get to choose which hospital the ambulance takes you to. And I said, well, we move people around all the time from hospital to hospital. You know, not every hospital does radiotherapy. If you are in even one of the bigger hospitals and you need radiotherapy, we, we put you in an ambulance very comfortably and take you to the cancer agency and you have your radiotherapy and you can come back and forth five days in a week to have that done. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no reason why you can't be moved. Mm -hmm. so, and then she says to me, well, what if you're too sick to move? And I said to her, think about what you just said to me. What you just said to me is that it would be a shame if the person died before we had a chance to kill them, you know? And, and you know, this has played out. Uh, people, this, this whole thing about um, people wanting to have euthanasia and they'll be moved out of St. Paul's Hospital and there's all of this, this yeah. uh, disastrous coverage about how they, they suffered on the way to the Vancouver Hospice and all of these right. things. The only reason they did that is that they wanted they didn't want to take medication that could have made them comfortable so that they would not, so they would, there wouldn't be any chance of them being considered incompetent when they got to the new place so that somebody could take their life. That's there right. Was no reason that they couldn't have been comfortable. So right. you know, these things, uh, and that's the way it's reported in the media. So these things are, these are the things that drive us crazy. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think if, if people in Canada, if citizens in Canada, want to have physicians and nurses and pharmacists and, and others, other healthcare professionals who don't believe in taking the lives of patients, then they need to stick up for these people. They need to um, make sure that their legislatures pass conscience protection uh, legislation, not just sort of uh, verbal or written um, edicts from the, the central government that needs to be real legislation that needs to be passed because um, there, is, there is a group of people headed up by uh, so-called ethicists who are not clinicians in, in Canada who have written articles, for example, that say that no one should be admitted to medical school who is not willing to perform anything that is legal. 
So if you want to be an eye doctor and you're not willing to do abortions, you are not allowed to be it, uh, admitted to medical school in Canada. If you want to be uh, um, you know, a, a lab physician and you're not willing to perform euthanasia, you should not be admitted to medical school because right. you contaminate the, uh, the, the ethos of the profession. Uh, wow. by dragging your heels and by saying every life counts, every life is digni dignified, every, every person has dignity. We can care for each other. We don't have to kill each other. These, mm -hmm. these are the fundamental things about what makes us proud to be Canadians. You know, mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're shooting ourselves in the foot when we do this. We really are. We're, right. we're this little false idea that somehow, oh, well, we can eliminate this kind of suffering, we're creating suffering that is far more overwhelming. Right, right. Well, on that note, um, and I think absolutely, it's, it's, it's such a shame. And it's so, you see how totalitarian it's becoming. It's very draconian, you know, so much for choice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do want to give some time to our questioners. So we're, we've got about 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to stop for our little commercial break that we do each session, and um, I'm going to just uh, switch to that, and then we're going to come back, and uh, you can put some questions either in the chat or the Q&A, and uh, uh, let me just cue this up, and we'll come right back. Share my screen here. Welcome to Life Canada. We are Canada's national educational organization, assisting our member groups to effectively reach out to their communities. Life Canada educates, trains, and strengthens hundreds of dedicated pro-lifers across Canada. Life Canada is well known for its national polling. For years, we have surveyed the public on the issues of abortion and euthanasia. We have been an invaluable source for tracking popular opinion, and we have built a demographic profile of the Canadian population. Our 2019 anniversary poll marked the 50 years since abortion was legalized. We found that only 8% of Canadians support late-term abortions, while in Canada no law exists to restrict abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy. Only 2% of Canadians support abortions that target girls. In Canada, however, sex selection abortions are not illegal. Among our many activities are our national conferences. These fantastic educational conferences unite and educate the whole pro-life community. They are often a great catalyst for even more pro-life initiatives nationwide. Since 2000, Life Canada has provided multimedia campaigns to our member groups that help them educate their communities. In 2019, we helped to organize the Missing Project that consisted of 50 individual interviews and a full-length documentary on the subject of abortion. Individuals across Canada were interviewed and were able to share with the public just how much abortion has made an impact on their lives. Life Canada provides programming to our groups that stimulate their growth and enrichment. Our Dying Healed program is a vital volunteer recruitment and training program. Since its launch in 2017, we have trained over 1,000 volunteers, giving people confidence in end-of-life issues and helping them serve the lonely, ill, and dying. Our training program is in more than 25 communities, bringing solid end-of-life formation to volunteers. Life Canada has a huge social media presence through our Facebook page, reaching tens of thousands of people every week. In order for Life Canada to continue to help shape the culture, we need your help. At our last annual gala event in Vancouver, BC, we raised over $100,000. We need to continue changing hearts and minds, and so we ask for financial support. Monthly donations are especially important to us. Our national conferences are costly, but $100 will allow a young person to attend, whose first exposure to the pro-life movement could be through these conferences. $200 will supply our Outstanding Reflections magazine to 10 member groups for one year. $300 will enable the Dying Heal program to be run in a community near you. Whatever you can give, we are truly grateful. Please go to www.lifecanada.org slash pledge to make a pledge today. When you make a pledge and donate at www.lifecanada.org forward slash pledge, you will receive a PDF of our new beautiful magazine on adoption. Thank you for your support of Life Canada. 
Great. So just a little plug there for Life Canada for the work that we do. And especially at this time, um, as many of you know that um, giving is down with the whole COVID crisis, understandably. So if you can find it in your heart, even just to give 10 or $15, um, consider a monthly donation uh, to Life Canada to keep us going so we can have incredible people like Dr. Margaret Cottle coming and talking to us and educating us. Um, this is also being run live on Facebook. And the last one we ran live on Facebook, we had 1500 views. So it's, it really, you know, this is a great opportunity. And, and just, this is just so great to talk to you, Dr. Cottle. And you're just so full of knowledge um, and articulate and engaging. And I wanna get to the questions now. Um, uh so i heiko's question is really is really quite good that was earlier there about what's driving this um that that's in there and i think there are there are a couple of things one thing that's driving it we we touched on already and that's fear that people are afraid of what's coming you talked about Brittany Maynard and how she was afraid of what was coming uh, ahead. So there is, there is a lot of that. And there's some fear that comes from people who have watched a loved one die badly in the past and who have not had proper care. And so that's a little scary when you think, well, is that gonna happen to me? Um, and what's gonna happen? And they don't realize what's out there and what's available. So some of those fears can be um, allayed by proper education and people getting to know that. I think a, a really good sense of community where you feel well supported and not alone is also something that can help with that. And the Dying Healed program that you have and other things really, really do help with that. The, mm -hmm. the other thing that we see that the main reason that people want to have euthanasia is because they want to feel a sense of control. It's this feeling like, well, I'm going to get death before death gets me. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's kind of... Um, <laughs> It's kind of backwards, but that's what it's there. And I think one of the things that's happened in COVID is that we've, we've maybe lost a little bit of our illusions about the control that we thought we had. Um, if this little virus has been able to wreak so much havoc uh, around the world, and we realize that we, we don't really even have control over those things, that um, it's let's just say people that are living a subsistence life on sub-Saharan Africa, eking out whatever they can get on a little farm are not asking for this. This is, a, this is a, a first world issue where people have this illusion of control and they, they wanna keep it. Uh, and you know, it, control and, uh, and independence is not, a, is not really a virtue for the human family. Interdependence is the virtue within the human family. And those of us who need care have a duty to receive that care just as much as those who are giving the care have a duty to give it. Um, so the, keep it, there, is there anybody keeping track of illegal made events? I think you can talk to Alex Schadenberg at the uh, Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. I think they're keeping uh, track of the ones that they know about, but you know, um, it's it, unless it's pretty high profile and unless the family complains, and even when the family does complain, there's really not a lot that can be done because the way the legislation is written, it's written that as long as the doctor intended it to be good and the intention was there, um, that there's, there's, no, there's no liability. You actually have more liability if you treat someone than if you take somebody's life. So it's, you know, that's the way it's, that's the way it's written. That's the way they want it to be written. Um, even helping out somebody to do it, uh, you know, you can't be, you can't be prosecuted for that. Um, I think um, even in your article, you've, you've got quite a lot of stuff there about how things are kind of shaken down in the real world yeah. in terms of, you know, they're waiving uh, their 10-day um, waiting uh, oh, yeah. periods oh. and the assessing that's not being properly done. You oh, know, yeah, now it's done by telephone. You know, yeah. over COVID, we can now do it over the telephone. And right. even when the personal protective equipment was in short supply here in BC, you could still get personal protective equipment if you were the person who was going to go out and take somebody's life. 
you know, it's just, I mean, it, it, it's almost breathtaking the yeah. way, the way that these things, these things happen. And this, this idea, it really is being normalized. In fact, if you read nothing else in this article, you should read the little paragraph about the, the doctor who, who put a continuing medical education, uh, a little one quarter of a credit hour together for the University of BC about normalizing euthanasia for children and about how when she goes yeah. through a euthanasia death, that if the adults, and she says right in the article, if the yeah. adults who are there normalize this, the children will get it. And she sets out her instruments and her syringes and all of the things. And she says, I'm quoting pretty closely, yeah. um, these are the things that I'm going with, lets the child stand there and says, these are the things that I'm going to use to help your loved one die. I'll stand here so that you can look at them and you can ask me any questions that you have. Yeah. yeah. And then after the person is dead, she refuses to call the person by name. She calls it the body because the person's gone and this child needs to get used to the fact that it's not grandma anymore. It's just the body. So, you know, if some of these things don't chill you, mm. you know, I, 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 mm. I don't know. Yeah, I read and, that. So the other question here about how, do you think that many palliative care units are already adapting to this new ideology? I don't think they are doing it willingly, but um, in so many places, it's just been forced down their throats that the people who are the bean counters and the administrators in the different health authority areas and in the provinces have thrown this idea of palliative, uh, of hasten death into the palliative care end of life basket. And uh, people who have never had any experience with this are being asked to administer it and they're being told they have to have it. Um, you know, the, one of the hospitals where I have privileges, the, the, the people have a wonderful palliative care unit there. And they wanted, they knew that people are afraid to go there sometimes because they feel like their death is going to be hastened. So they said, well, we won't do it on the unit. If somebody wants to have it, we're not going to stand in their way. They can go through those double doors there to a room, you know, 20 feet down the hall and have it done there. But then everybody else who's left in the unit will know that it's never done here. And so they'll just relax. They'll know, you know, as long as I'm here, it's not going to happen. The, the hospital administration and the health authority said, no, that couldn't happen. It was, um, it was degrading to, it was disrespectful to the people that have to move. Well, if you no longer want intensive care or qualify for intensive care, nobody says, oh, you like your nurses too much, you get to stay in the intensive care unit. No, you get moved. If you have an infection, you get moved. If you don't want the kind of treatment on the, nobody says you have to stay on the kidney unit, the dialysis unit, if you decided not to have dialysis anymore. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's all ridiculous that they're doing this and they forced it down people's throats. And so what happens then is that it's harder for people to work there who, um, who hold to those values, the, the traditional palliative care values kind of can change or virtues or or principles let's call it um and but and, and so and then you have nursing staff who don't feel comfortable staying there so gradually there is a shift of things and younger people are being taught in medical school that this is just as part of medical care so you know we do we do see that there has has been a drift but it doesn't have to stay that way um right you know we need to push back push back. And you know what? It may come to the place where we as Canadians are going to have to go back to caring for our loved ones in our own homes again. Because right. I can foresee the government saying, we will not license you, even if you pay for it yourself, even if you pay all your staff, even if you take not one red cent of government money, we won't give you a license to practice as a long-term care facility or a hospice. Um, and if you don't, if you're not licensed to practice, then you can't get workers' compensation. You can't get insurance. You can't get uh, even probably insurance on your building. So um, what we're going to have to do is be prepared to help each other, just like back in the old days, where when somebody got sick, everybody in the community came along and took a shift helping out at the house when, when mother was sick. Yeah. You know, we have to be prepared to do that because 
you know, we, we've seen what's happened already in these long-term care homes and uh, people that moved in to be with their parents or hauled their parents out at the last minute. Um, you know, it's, we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to put some blood, sweat and tears into dealing with really caring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, really gonna force us to, to rethink um, these models of care. Any other questions in there? Can you, uh, you um, that you well, haven't touched on yet? Let's see, what can be done to legislate? I'm not sure what can be done. And Sharon Carstairs, things have just been left behind by the Liberal government. Um, the, the one thing I'd like to address is, is Irene, who has said, you know, talked about her mother and that um, two years ago she was in palliative care and she, after she stopped dialysis and they started these, these uh, drugs quickly, even though she wasn't in discomfort and she died within days. And she says, I still feel a lot of guilt. Um, please let that go. <laughs> I'm sure you did everything for your mother that you were able to do. And um, part of being healthy and being resilient and being able to help other people uh, in these situations is to say, I wish instead of I should. Um, I wish it had been different, but not I should have. Uh, and um, Focus on all the care and the love that you gave to your mother for all those other years of her life. And uh, just know that she was comfortable at the end and you did what you could. Uh, who knows that if you had created a big stink over this, that she might have been way less comfortable than she was. Um, we, we don't have as much control as we do. And I hear stories all the time from people who get these, who who end up um, being barred from seeing their loved one because they're asking questions. So that would have been way worse for your mother if you had kicked up a stink about this and they said, well, fine, you just can't come. Um, I've, I've been involved in several cases where they have, they have accused the, the loved ones who have simply wanted the best and not wanted the person to die uh, of, of being abusive and have kept them out of, mm -hmm. of, from seeing. And, you know, that's certainly not what you want. So right. uh, give yourself some grace for, for that situation. And um, the thing you can do is pay it forward a little. And if you know that a friend of yours uh, has a mom in that situation or something, go come alongside them, be there, uh, love each other. You know, one of the things that uh, I heard at a, a debate a long time ago was that rights are an admission that love has failed. And so uh, think about that, you know, that if we all cared about each other and looked out for each other uh, in ways that would be the best way possible, then we wouldn't really need rights <laughs> because everybody would be looking out for my rights and I wouldn't need to look out for my own. Well, we know that that's not gonna happen because uh, as Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil runs right through the center of every human heart. And we all have these places where we're not always doing those things for each other. But we need to think about the, the most important thing is love. It's not rights. It's not, oh, if I'm not, if, if, if I wanna end my suffering, just have somebody do it for me. It's coming alongside that person with love and saying, we're sad with you. Uh, we wanna weep with you. We want to, we wanna care for you. We want to, alleviate your symptoms. We want to help you reframe hope. We want to help you find joy. We want you to know that you have dignity just because you're a member of our human family. So that, that's what we can do. Uh, love is the, is the most important thing. And I don't mean some kind of mushy feeling. I mean real active love. Uh, the, in French, the word to be with someone is accompagner. And it means to be radically present with someone. And one of my French colleagues said, is the reason before all of this came down, is the reason that we're seeing this push for euthanasia and assisted suicide in Canada because we're not teaching our medical learners how to really accompany, how to really be with people when they're suffering in ways that are safe for the patient and for the carer. Um, I just had a uh, question here from Betty about how do you reframe hope? Well, that's where you ask the patient, you know, what, what, what gives you hope? What are the things that you're looking forward to? Uh, 
maybe you are not going to live to your 50th wedding anniversary, but maybe there's a grandchild uh, who's coming. Maybe there's, uh, maybe you'd like to write down some of your memoirs. Maybe you'd like to, uh, there's some really interesting things that some of my patients have done. One lady, one of the things she did was she went to Burke's, the jewelry store, and I'm not making a, 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 an advertisement for them, but she went to a jewelry store and she had two little granddaughters. And she picked out a birthday present for each of them, I think they were eight and 10, for every year for their birthday until they each reached 21. And Burks kept it in the vault for them and, and delivered it on the birthday of these granddaughters. Wow. And another mom said, I don't want anybody else to be the one to tell the facts of life to my daughter. And she's only six, so I'm gonna make a video. So she did. She made a video about, you know, when she got to be whatever age the dad thought it needed to be, that she would, she would, uh, they would get to see this video that mom had made. So there's, and there's some great apps that help you make these things. There's uh, Dignity Therapy that Dr. Chachanoff had that's a legacy mm -hmm. building. There's, there's all kinds of ways to reframe hope. We just need to be more creative than saying, you know, oh, you wish you were dead. Well, we can make that happen, you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much to do that. It right. takes a lot of creativity and energy to come alongside people and, and help. Just the same way if you've got a bored four-year-old, you know, so I'm bored. Well, you know, it's, it's easy to flip on the television, but it's, it's harder to do the creative work. And mm -hmm. so are, are we going to be the people of creativity, of, of ingenuity? Passion? Of, of caring, what kind of legacy do we want to have? What kind of people do we want to be? What kind of society do we want to have? And what kind of story do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a story that says we care for each other, we love each other, we help people find meaning even in the midst of difficult situations? Or are we going to live in a story that says, you know, once it's not fun anymore, once you're not pretty anymore, once you're not um, useful anymore, we'll help you check out. You know, what story do you want to live in? In fact, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. John Patrick, once debated Dr. Peter Singer, who's a Princeton um, ethicist who believed in all sorts of horrible things. But at the end of it, they, they decided they, they agreed they wouldn't do any ad hominem attacks. So at the end of this long day, one of the students got up and said, you know, Dr. Patrick, Dr. Singer, you both made some very compelling arguments. But what I have to say, is that I want to live in Dr. Patrick's world. And that's the kind of people I want us to be. I want us to be the kind of people as Canadians who say, I want to live in this world. And mm -hmm. you know, we know how to do this. That family in, in Halifax who lost all their children in that horrible house fire and the husband was really badly burned. Nobody said, oh, we should offer euthanasia to that mother. We should just go ahead and, and, and give euthanasia to that father because they've lost all their children and it's so horrible. They said, no, we're going to come alongside them and be with them in the midst of this and make sure they make it through. That's what we're about. We're not just saying, oh, it's awful. You know, we're going to put you out of our misery. Yes. Very good. And I think we'll end on that note, Dr. Cottle. <laughs> I know, it's hard to keep me quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful note. It's very much along the lines of what we talk about with our Dying Hill program. Yeah. We really go into this, you know, the whole, the whole psychology really behind um, real caregiving yeah. and, and what it means. For, for the individual themselves and for us who have the opportunity to step outside of ourselves and really give of ourselves to the sake of the other and what it does to the whole, our whole world, really our whole community. You, you, can't, you can't imagine the dividends that that pays. You know, my, right. own, my own mother died when she was way younger than I am now. And my sister and I had an opportunity to give her her last bath in her bed when she was near the end of her life. Her sister was coming to visit and she's a nurse and we knew we had to have her in top shape before she, right. before she got there. But um, so we gave her this bath and it was just amazing. The two of us, it was this, this beautiful moment of caring for her in a way that was soothing to her. And you know, we have never 
that that's a li one of those gold things that we we have never lost. She's been gone for uh, 35 years and mm -hmm. still something that we hold so dear in our hearts and it has bonded my sister and me too in mm -hmm. in the midst of that. So, you know, you as hard as it is at the time, you you get something so worthwhile that can never be taken from you right. when you do that. Right, right. Good. Well, thank you so much. Thank well, you for your time and your wisdom and your expertise. And um, everyone watching, I will be in touch. Uh, we have this recorded so that you can watch it again. And we've had uh, people on Facebook watching. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cottle. And, You're welcome. Uh, thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.